afternoon. Happy Friday. Made it to the end of the week. Worth celebrating with a picture of a Stellar's Jay, um, close close relative of the Blue Jays that we we have around here. You can always tell when there's a, a Blue Jay nearby by their distinctive like ah! call. It's it's it's, uh, it's quite something. Uh, also have a, a great blue heron. Um, have those around here uh, too. Sometimes even on uh, one of the ponds. This is the aptly named long-tailed duck, um, due to its, uh, you know, the the spot on its beak. I'm I'm sure. Um, these are uh, a pair, male and female, of ring-necked ducks. Uh, maybe that's the the ring right there. I'm not sure. Uh, here are some snow geese uh, parading in, in precise formation. Uh, and when you get a close look at uh, a snow goose, it looks like it's clenching its teeth. Of course, it, it doesn't have any teeth. The beak is just ridged um, uh, to, to allow it to, um, I guess, probably pull plants uh, apart. And a uh, bit of a, a non-bird, a couple painted turtles uh, enjoying the sun, uh, and we'll come back to the, the Stellar Jay, Stellar's Jay in a more majestic pose as our, our last bird. Uh, questions about uh, the lab, assembly, anything like that to get us started? Christian. I'm sure that's just a coincidence. Uh, um, yeah, I would I would speak to a good lawyer um, if I if I were you. Um, so I spent a bit of time looking into the mystery that was this uh, maximally optimized code for uh, a function like sum n just sums the numbers from uh, 1 to n, returns the sum. And when we turned on uh, maximum optimization in GCC, it produced this kind of massive pile of, of code in comparison to uh, the unoptimized version, which had a loop that was just four instructions, a test, a jump, an add, a subtract. What we would expect? But somehow this uh, whole mess was about four times faster than the unoptimized version. So I looked into this. One thing that this code is doing is that it compares 10 to the argument. And if the argument is less than or equal to 10, it jumps to this label L8. If we look at the label L8, It zeroes out EX, jumps back up to L3, which doesn't use a loop, just does kind of manually the assembly for up to 10 loops worth. Um, so this is the sort of optimized version we're going to do exactly the number of loops uh, that, we, um, that we need without the need for a compare, just using the, sub the result of the subtract here to check if we've hit zero. So that's one thing, but that doesn't explain why for uh, summing one to a billion, it was four times faster. So, and look at this code and say, all right, these six instructions are the actual loop part where we compare and jump back to L4. But this is six instructions and the unoptimized version was four instructions. So again, how is it faster? If we look at what it sets up before it calls our, um, uh, before it, it performs this, uh, this sum n, it actually uh, uh, is comparing uh, 25, uh, 250 million instead of a billion. So it's for this billion input, it's actually doing a quarter of that. And I thought it was 
interesting to take a look at this code in GDB. No, not that one. That's what I named it. Um, and we'll break some, at some n and we'll run. And if we uh, watch our uh, assembly uh, and we kind of step through our C code into our loop, um, and we're seeing it's doing these things with these XMM registers, which I told you were these like streaming uh, <laughs> single instruction multiple data. And we can actually ask GDB to print these out. <clears throat> and it shows us that if we are dealing with ints, it can t this register contains kind of four ints next to each other. And they're counting down from one billion. And when we and we see kind of the first four for one billion, and then the next four after that. And if we step a couple times forward, we see that this XMMM1 has the sums of the first four pairs of elements we're summing. So the reason that this um, optimized version has to iterate only one fourth the number of times is actually adding four numbers at the same time with each instruction because it's using the single instruction multiple data um, extension that has these big registers that can hold multiple ints at once and kind of uh, add kind of each int within there uh, in parallel. And what's also kind of funny is that XMMM2 holds the in it holds four integers all negative four because it's subtracting four each time from to get the next four ints that it wants. So I thought that was interesting. It there is indeed an explanation for why this optimized code is faster. It's because it can do four additions at once instead of one. So it gets about four times faster. Because once we're doing a million iterations, all these extra instructions barely matter compared to how many times we go around the loop. Um, all right. I just thought that was cool and wanted to, to follow up with that. Uh, Louisa. Is there a way to nicely indent our data sets? Um, like, if you go to the Safari thing, you can see that the loops are kind of indented, and here, just like in one line, it's like uh, that's, uh, that would be nice if we could have GDB nicely format the assembly. Um, what GDB has to work with is uh, the machine code in the compiled executable. So uh, there, GDB is not sophisticated enough to just based on that information give us sort of uh, a nicely formatted assembly that identifies where the loops are and, and so on. Have to do that ourselves. Other questions? All right, one point I wanted to clarify on the lab is um, I go to my bomb from the other day, and there's this uh, file. Uh, and I can print it out on the command line using the cat command called diffuse.txt. Currently has nothing in it. Uh, but the goal of the lab, you're not changing the bomb at all. That's fixed. You're trying to figure out what text to feed into the bomb to diffuse phase one, and then what the next line of text should be to diffuse phase two. And so you're going through the assembly basically saying, OK, I want this function to return without ever calling explode bomb. First, how does it use the input that you enter, and then how, uh, what input would cause it to get to the return without ever calling explode bomb. 
and uh, we saw uh, last time that there was a string uh, in the phase one function uh, there and back again, uh, period. So I might put that into my diffuse, uh, no, thank you, um, in my diffuse.txt and then uh, run my bomb uh, with that, uh, with that input, and it says phase one diffused, how about the next one? So now it's waiting for my input to phase two. Uh, is this right? Uh, no. So uh, one important thing to be aware of for diffuse.txt, uh, it worked in this case with uh, the first input, um, but it's, uh, if you have uh, kind of more than one line, uh, always make sure there's a blank line at the end. Like if you change diffuse.txt and it's, it's um, if it's blowing up and you're not sure why or you're getting a weird end of file error in GDB, check that there's a blank line at the end of, of diffuse.txt um, since the, the bombs um, can be uh, a little squirrely about that. Uh, any questions on, uh, on the lab? All right. So I'd like to do a little practice. Nope, not that. Here we go. So here's some assembly for a function f. And uh, to uh, practice understanding what uh, assembly code is doing, now that we know how loops work and conditionals work, I'd like you to translate this assembly into C code. So figure out C code that would do something equivalent to this assembly, many different uh, <coughs> possible C codes that would be equivalent. Uh, so work uh, either on your own or with your neighbors to do that translation. This is the type signature of this function f. Returns a long, takes a pointer to a long. Why is that So one of the key components of understanding what this assembly code is doing is you know, what conditions, what Boolean expression would these two test and jumps in code. Um, so if we test a value with itself and then we have jump not equal, what uh, what sort of comparison might we be doing expressed in C? Silas? If it doesn't equal zero, if this test doesn't end with itself, right? And so it will only return zero if it's already zero. Or no, yeah, yes. Yeah, if we look at the, at our table of jumps, we combine a test with jump not equal, we're gonna jump when a and B do not equal zero. And since we're ending at something with itself, we're just getting whatever values in RDI, and we're jumping if that does not equal zero. All right, how about our second test and jump? Again, we're testing something with itself, and then we have JS. What, what sort of condition might this give us? John? It's going to check if the number at Rx is less than zero and the jump is negative. <laughs> exactly. The JS is jump signed. We're going to jump if the result of A and B is negative. A and B are the same, so we're jumping if Rx is negative, Rx less than zero. So we have these two pieces. We have some 
if comparison to uh, to zero here. So what uh, if it's RDI? What do we know what variable that is that we're checking? Jay? It's the pointer key. <coughs> Why is that? Because RDI is the first number one. <laughs> so that's number one. If we had a second variable, I don't remember, but it wouldn't be RDI because that would be the RSI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then yeah. RAX is whatever we're checking. Exactly. We know that RDI is going to hold the first argument to any procedure, so it must be P. So we're doing some comparison with P and zero. If P is a pointer, which we know that it is, what might this condition actually look like in C? Huh? Uh, we could say if if not P, uh, if we were to use like our, our not equals over here, I mean, what what we're comparing P to. Yeah, it's a pointer, so we if we're comparing it to zero, null is how we write zero as a, like the memory address zero. Um, so, if p does not equal null, then we are jumping, uh, and if we don't jump, what happens? Eric? Yeah, we're going to return negative one if we don't jump, uh, which uh, might mean, as we've seen before, that the assembly is sort of expressing the opposite of the condition that you might write in C. If P is null, return negative one. And so the assembly is jumping past this return negative one uh, if p does not equal. Uh, all right, so now what sort of C structure do we have, uh, Eric? I uh, was just wondering how do we know it's not like an if else, where the else is return negative one, and if it's if p is not equal. Oh, it absolutely could be an if else, or uh, uh, it could be um, if p plus 1 equals equals no plus 1. There's like all sorts of different ways we could write the C code that would end up compiled into this assembly. And kind of any time we're doing this translation in either direction, there's never kind of one way to, to, to do it. Um, so uh, I've picked this way because I, I wrote the C code. So I know that this, this is what's going to show up when I show you the C code. Uh, and this is also like a pretty normal thing to see in C. Uh, compare a pointer to null as a sort of check before you do anything else. Um, so we're jumping to L3. What sort of structure would these five assembly instructions get yeah, Louisa? Yeah, why, why do you think it's a, a while loop? Yeah, we have uh, a, a Boolean condition that is checked when we go around, uh, go around a loop. And actually, in all cases where you don't have a continue statement, a for loop can be written, like rewritten as a while loop. So, uh, we can say um, while, and theories on what our while condition is going to be. We know that this pair of instructions is checking Rx uh, less than zero, but what might that? How might that show up in our in our C code based on what else is going on? Aiden, x star is or sorry, p star is one and zero. Yeah, so we see that we move the thing stored at the address. We have parentheses around RDI that says dereference that pointer. Get what's in memory there. That's our uh, dereference operator in C. We'll star P is less than zero. 
And what do we do inside this loop? Come on. Star P plus equals 10. How, how do we know, how, do, how did you get that this is what, what will happen? Because bar x is just the D reference star P, which essentially has to be the empty reference both sides, and the loop would just add Q to it, would just add it. Yeah, so we know we're adding 10 to the current value P points to, and then that second move instruction there shows that we're moving it back to memory. So now we're both, we're both getting the current value that P points to, adding 10 to it, and then moving it back to memory which we can express in, in one line of C code. Um, anything else in our, in our while loop? What else do we need to do for this function? Okay. Same thing? Oh, we say uh, <coughs> return uh, P star. Uh, and is that inside the loop, outside the loop? Oh, outside. Uh, return the value that, that P points to, because that's what will be in RAX uh, at the end of the function. Etienne? Would it be faster to set up to a variable and then increase that by 10 because we're the user and then assign it Yeah, that's, that's uh, a good point. A good point, would it be faster if instead of writing this code where we're continually updating a pointer, we save its current value in a local variable, add on to that, and then modify it at the very end? So why don't we take a look at how uh, doing that, that's not this one, so uh, we, we decoded our, our assembly into C uh, as, as expected. And if instead we did get the current value, and modify that, and then Write it back to memory at the end. Uh, we see that our loop now has, we have dropped that move instruction. We're, we're no longer moving, doing a round trip to memory. Every time we go around the loop, we know that that's slower than accessing a register. So absolutely, this would be um, uh, a faster version of, of this function, at least for, for a large negative value of P where we end up iterating a number of times. Other questions about this? All right. There's uh, a final control flow structure, a, a, a structure in C that uh, can cause our code to branch in, in different directions. Uh, you may have, have seen this uh, uh, before in other, in other contexts, but uh, just so they're all, the same, all on the same page. Uh, this is the switch statement, uh, something that, that um, Java and C both have. Python does not, though I think they're actually adding a switch statement to Python um, in the upcoming version. But the idea is that we have switch with some argument. And <coughs> it has to be used with some integer type. So uh, char, int, long, <coughs> those short. And then inside the switch, we have different cases, and we go to the one that matches the value of x. So we might have case 1, 
case two, and works is that whatever value of, uh, is uh, passed into the, the switch, it's matched against the values listed for these different cases. If it doesn't match any of them, and the switch has a default case, we'll execute that. And uh, if x matches nothing and there is no default, we wouldn't do any of it. We would just skip it entirely. So there's not we could anything we could express with a switch, we could express with some if, if else else if structure. But in some cases, it makes for a more readable uh, uh, C code to do it as a switch to have these as different cases. Uh, if we're just checking if some something is a particular integer value. And as we'll see in a moment, uh, there's uh, an interesting and efficient way that a switch statement gets implemented in assembly, which might also make it advantageous in some situations. The one profoundly strange thing about switch that, uh, is that it has what's called Fall through behavior, which means that when we do a case, we keep going to the next case unless something stops us. So unless we get to a break or we get to a return, we'll just keep going. So if x is 2, we'll do x equals x plus 2 and then x equals x plus 1 before we hit the break and exit the switch. We go to case 3. We subtract one from x and then break, and wouldn't continue on to the default. Right. Questions on this? Yeah, yeah. Mm, so for case one, if it's written several, would it go to case two still? Uh, yeah, the question is if, if we do case one and get to this return seven, and then we continue on. Uh, because return is going, whatever function this is in, return is going to end that function and we go back to where it was called. Uh, Any time we get to a return, we won't do anything after it, whether it's in a switch or anywhere else in our code. So, so. Does this mean that if you don't have a break after case two, it's going to do default as well? Yeah, if we didn't have this break at the end of case three, we'll also continue into default. It just keeps going down until something stops it, either a break or, or a return, and we get to the end of the switch. Other questions? Yeah. Oh. If like you change x during the running of it, or like copy the pieces, so, like if case two is if x equals two and case three is x equals four, and you give it two, when case two sets x to four, will that also in case three be true? Or will it work? Uh, the, yeah, the question is, changing the value of the thing we put in, does that affect the behavior of the switch? It does not. It's just like a single jump to, based on the value of x when we start, we go to some case and then we're just executing down from, down from there regardless of, of what happens to, um, to x because this switch of x is uh, getting the value of x at this point. It's not setting up some ongoing relationship of the switch with the variable x. Does that make sense? Other questions? Yeah, Sean. Yes, the question was, 
we are doing a switch on x. If we then change the value of x inside the switch, does that affect what happens? It does not. When we start the switch, we get the current value of x that tells us which case we go to, and then after that, we're just kind of going down, executing line by line as normal. John? But like, the value of x persists between those like fall through cases though, right? Like, it's, it's not like jumping around from case to case based on the value of x, like there's just one jump, but like in this case, for example, like if x was uh, four going in, then we'd get x equals six out of case two, but then x equals five out of case three. I mean, if, if x was four going in, we'd go to, to default, because it doesn't, x would have to be one, two, or Sorry, three. if it was two, then it would become four and then three. Yes, exactly. Yeah, if, it, if x started at as two, we'd make it four, and then make it three, and that's yeah. Um, I don't know if it's probably going to ask this question, but is fall through behavior like above or future? Like, do you use the factor of fall through behavior, or are you trying to avoid the fact that you like trying to break or return in each case? Um, so, someone thought it was a feature because they decided to make it part of the, the C language. Uh, I think, uh, in general, it relying on fall through behavior is considered a bug. Because it is like very weird to write code that way, yeah. um, and uh, yeah, in um, in languages that have kind of a, a switch-like thing, but that isn't just matching integers, can sort of match arbitrary values and even values within structures. Um, they don't have all. There's no such such thing. Uh, so no, I would say this is just like a weird design decision, uh, and you probably shouldn't write code that relies on it. Chris? Um, in the class notes, you have kind of like misnumbered cases. Is the number just arbitrary, like the number of cases? Yes, that's, that's a good question. I'll get to that example in a moment, but there's no requirement that uh, the values be in order, or that we have all values in a range, where you have case 1,000, case negative 3, and default. That that would be amazing. That's something that more modern languages can do. Not not in, in Java or C. Switch statements. It's equal to a particular integer value, and that's all we can do. John. Um, so could you could you use all through behavior to like make the code more readable in the sense that like if you wanted a bunch of different cases to do the same thing, you could just have like a bunch of empty cases and then like the Case. Yes, so let me bring up uh, a bigger example of switch that, um, that if uh, we could have something like this where uh, we have just an empty case 5, if we go to case 5, it's the same as going to case 6. They both start with the line here. So you could kind of pile up a bunch of cases if you have a bunch of values where you all want the same thing to happen. So the reason that I am talking about switch is that it involves the third kind of jump that we have in assembly that we have not talked about yet. And so we have had uh, the direct jump where we just jump to a specific label no matter what. We've had the conditional jump, where depending on whether something, uh, some condition is meant, we jump. And we also have the indirect jump, which says Go to a memory address. And use the value stored in memory there as the thing you're jumping to, as the address of the next instruction to execute. So it's indirect. Oh, <laughs> 
in that we have memory and there's some part of memory that is what we're going to call a jump table. And it has, say, somewhere uh, in memory here, there is the address for some code that should be executed. So when we do this indirect jump, which will look like this, where we have JMP, and then we'll have an asterisk, a star, and some memory address. It says go to this address, and then use the values stored there as where we actually jump to. So the way that this is used for a switch is if we're jumping on X, we say we'll set up in memory basically an array of pointers where each of them points to the code we want for a particular case of the switch. So here would be our return 7, our uh, case 2 would point, there'd be um, a part of our jump table that would point to where the instructions were to do x equals x plus 2 at uh, kind of index 3 in our table. Points the code to do x uh, equals x minus 1, and then some likely some other jump, since we have a break and we want to kind of jump out of the switch statement at that point. And default would also uh, maybe point to an entirely different, uh, different spot in memory where we would do return negative one. And yeah. And so what this looks like in assembly is that we have our indirect jump and we have some memory address that's the start of our jump table. And then we add to that address some offset into the table, some number of spots into our table based on the value of the thing that our switch is applied to. So in this example on the screen, we have switch of x. x is our first argument is going to be an RDI. And this indirect jump says, OK, L4 is the start of this jump table, which just has a bunch of other labels, a bunch of other addresses. And it says, OK, jump to L4 plus RDI times 8. So here RDI is like an index into our jump table. And then we get whatever label, whatever address is there. And that's where we actually go to start executing the code. So it means that we can express this conditional structure with this kind of one indirect jump. Takes us to the code for, for a specific case. Silas? But if your case is like case 2 million or whatever, then doesn't that mean if you add, you don't want to have 2 million slots in your table? Yes, so if, say, we change this from 3 to 30,000, 
then the compiler decides, you know what, it doesn't make sense to use this jump table. Just have to do multiple different compares for these different cases with different jumps for, for different ones. So this, this switch, uh, this particular setup that I'm drawing is when you have uh, a moderate number of cases that aren't really spread out in terms of their values. Then we can do this one kind of indirect jump thing and uh, uh, kind of save ourselves um, uh, extra comparisons and, and jumps to, to do it without this sort of jump table idea. Uh, other questions? Yeah. How do I know it's eight or the compiler just decided to be eight? Uh, are you asking how do we know that this should be eight? So that comes from what it is that we are storing in this jump table. So each of these things here is a memory address. Each of the things in our table is the address of somewhere there's code that we should do for a particular case. And on a 64-bit system, memory addresses are eight bytes. So if we want to go from the first thing in the jump table to the third thing, we would go two steps, which is two eight-byte memory addresses. Away. So that's why we, we multiply our, um, our, our x here by, by eight. How like, does the jump table cause the ball to behavior? The code itself doesn't necessarily work for that. Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. How does this jump table achieve fall through behavior? Uh, it's based on how the code for the different cases are laid out. So if RDI is two for case two, that's the one up here that will have fall through behavior. And so that should jump us to L7. And if we look at L7, it does Y plus Z and then jumps to the code for case three, which is, is L6. So fall through is achieved by arranging the assembly for the different cases to achieve the fall through, either by putting them next to each other uh, in memory or adding a, uh, an unconditional jump. Other questions? All right, last thing on switch is just to show you what it looks like when we actually decompile. Instead of labels, we'll have an actual address in memory where our jump table is located. And we're jumping some offset from that, which means that if, we're, if we encounter this in GDB, we can use the, um, our, ability to, our ability to examine values in memory to find out what's in this jump table. Like starting with this address, every eight bytes is some part in, a, part in the jump table. And so we can actually use GDB to find the layout of the jump table, even though uh, it does not, the, the jump table uh, doesn't appear in this, this decompiled binary explicitly. Any other questions on switch? All right. So let's talk about compilation. So when we write a program in C, we need to go from C to machine code to be able to execute our program. Because machine code is what the CPU actually needs, C is what we're writing in, but there's, it's not one step to do this translation of C uh, into machine code. Uh, we start off with our text 
C program, maybe it's spread out over a few different files, p1.c, p2.c, and we use the compiler uh, and this instruction or this command line might be gcc uh, og dash s with our RC files, and this dash S tells it, just go to assembly and stop there. <laughs> and that's sort of the next stop on our journey to machine code. We're still dealing with, with text. Um, and we've turned our C program into our assembly program. And that's what we've mostly been looking at uh, in this compiler explorer is take this C code and turn it into this text assembly. And that's this step that the, the compiler uh, is doing. And uh, the next thing we want to do is to use the assembler, the kind of part of our tool chain that takes assembly into a binary format. And our assembler here, we could use gcc c with p1.s and p2.s, or instead of gcc.c, there'll be a tool as for assembler, or maybe gas for GNU assembler. And this will give us an object program. This is not actually all the way to a compiled executable that we could actually run because we went from kind of two C files to two assembly files to now two object files, p1.0 and p2.0. And so these are um, in binary. They're no longer ASCII text characters. Uh, they are uh, uh, in machine code. That's, that's what the binary, they're ones and zeros. But they're still separate. We haven't kind of put them together into a kind of a single program that we can run. And so, That's what a linker is for. And GCC or a program called, uh, or LD is the, often the linker program um, in, uh, on, on Linux. So, so GCC contains compiler, assembler, and linker. It does all three of these unless we're giving it some uh, command line argument to tell it to only do part of the step. The GCC can take us all the way here, but the linker is taking these object files, which let's say P1 that P1 calls a function that's defined in P2. 
That means at this step where there's still these separate object files, there's just a hole in, uh, in our, say, uh, p1.0 because it doesn't know like what memory address the instructions for this function in p2, where those are going to be. So at this point, we just have kind of uh, two do's in our object files that need to be filled in with an actual memory address uh, so that we can call some, some function. And so that's what our linker is, is doing. It's giving us a single binary file called the executable, maybe just called uh, what we've called it P, that has everything uh, brought together, all these holes filled in, so that we can actually just load it up uh, and uh, load, it, load those instructions into memory and run the program. Uh, if our P1 or, or P2, you would say standard library functions like printf or, or uh, sterlin or, or anything like that. The linker is where we would bring in any static libraries, any part of the standard library, anything that um, uh, has been compiled uh, to a .a file that we can just fill in um, uh, the, the kind of memory address where these functions are, are located. Uh, the reason to bring it in at this step is uh, many different programs on the computer <laughs> system may all be calling print or all be calling sterlin, and we don't want a separate copy of the instructions for those procedures in every single program. So instead, we just link into every program uh, the one place where we're storing these standard library functions. And that way, we can get away with just a single copy uh, of, of those instructions. All right, what are your questions on this compilation process? And so in lab two, when you're using GDB to look at the assembly for a program, or in uh, Compiler Explorer, when I click the, uh, the checkbox compile to binary, <coughs> instead of stopping an assembly, we compile the executable, and then we go one step, or in this case, two steps in reverse to go from the executable, uh, look at the bytes in memory, and decode those bytes into the assembly. And so uh, this view that we're, we're looking at here is we went to executable and then decoded them back into assembly. And that's why we see labels filled in with actual addresses, and it shows us the actual bytes in memory that we got when we went to the final executable. All right, any, any last questions? All right, awesome. Hope you have a great weekend. We'll uh, catch up with both arrays and structs on Monday, and I'll see you then. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.